I want to tell you a story. A story that begins four and a half billion years ago, the creation of this planet called Earth. About a billion years goes by until the first signs of life start swimming around in the primordial oceans. A few more billion years go by till 50,000 years ago, the first modern humans start walking around this amazing planet. Something really interesting happens about 38,000 years ago. They start leaving a permanent record, cave paintings. They're documenting the beliefs, the thoughts, the actions of a society for future generations. 8,000 years ago, the first surviving evidence of writing begins appearing. 550 years ago, this guy named Johannes Gutenberg comes along and creates the movable type printing press, enabling people to replicate and produce information at incredible volumes. Then 20 years ago, the first graphical web browser comes along, enabling the average person to just pour their thoughts, their ideas, everything around them out for posterity. I want to tell you about our digital world today. Fast forward to where we are at this moment. A third of the global population is online. There are as many cell phones as there are people on Earth. Facebook alone has 240 billion photographs, one billion members with one trillion connections among them. Each and every year, there are 6.1 trillion text messages. Can you move this slide? Thank you. 2.2 uh, trillion cell minutes are spoken in the US alone. 107 trillion emails. 1.6 million days of video are uploaded to YouTube every year. You think about that, 1.6 million days worth of video uploaded every year. And most of this isn't professional content by publishers. This is everyday people. Every day, two and a half billion new items are uploaded to Facebook. 300 million photographs are posted to Facebook. 500 terabytes of new data about society's innermost thoughts are posted. There are as many words posted to Twitter every single day as were published in every article of every issue of the entire New York Times over the last half century. 100 billion social media actions are taken every single day. Every minute, 600 new websites are created. 204 million emails are sent, proving that email is not yet dead. 700,000 shares occur on Facebook. 200,000 photographs are posted to Facebook. 277,000 tweets are sent every minute of every day. Pause for a moment to take all of this in. Nearly everything we do today is captured in digital form. We produce more information about ourselves and society around us and the world around us in an instant than our ancestors did in an entire generation. At the same time that we're experiencing this incredible data revolution, we're experiencing a similar, similar revolution in computing. Massive new supercomputers combining thousands of processors and tens of terabytes of memory into a single computer can be brought together to process petabytes and exabytes of data, allowing us to understand ourselves and the world around us in ways that we never even dreamed possible just, just decades ago. Today, people from Bangladesh to Buenos Aires busily tell one another and their neighbors what they see and what they think and what they feel and what's important to them around the world around them, offering unparalleled visibility into, the, into the, what global society is creating and producing. Moreover, this constant stream of daily life that flows across media platforms allows us to see ourselves and the world around us in incredible new ways. If ever we were at a point where we could use this to understand the heartbeat of global society, we are there. Citizens are becoming a vast, ground-braced social sensor network covering every inch of the world. A riot breaks out in the corner of South Africa, and images and commentary and live reports begin streaming in almost immediately. You think about what this means. Even journalism now is able to, tr to conceptualize this into rich tr narratives that transcend traditional boundaries. The first confirmation of Gaddafi's capture was a cell phone video captured by a participant and posted online. 
Osama bin Laden's super secret takedown was live tweeted by a Pakistani journalist and confirmed here in the US, not by a, an official press conference uh, in the Rose Garden, uh, but by a former administration official who tweeted, I heard from a friend in the White House, we got him. You think about what that means for society today. Of course, by this point, you're saying, well, what about me? You know, I'm a linguist, I'm a historian, a photographer, an engineer, a doctor. How can big data possibly play any role in what I am doing and where I'm going to be as a student? Well, let's say you're an urban planner. Today, the data allows us allows us to visualize the pulse of global society in real time. We can watch as people wake up, as they have breakfast at that neighborhood cafe, they take the subway to work, they go grab a Starbucks as they head into their office. We can visualize that. We can watch transportation networks. We can see as people move, and this is in real time. We can literally watch the nation wake up and go to sleep, and we can see how people move across it during the summertime, vacations. And all this is in real time. We can literally watch as our nation evolves through time. But what if I'm a linguist, you might say? Well, what if we take that map I showed you a second ago, which was a day in the life of Twitter in the United States, and instead of just putting a dot in the map where someone tweets, what if we color code that by the language that they're speaking? If we make purple, say, uh, French and blue Italian, what could we do? Well, we could map out linguistic enclaves. We could literally see, well, where do people stop speaking one language and begin speaking another language? What are highly multilingual cities? We can understand our world in, in ways that we've never thought of before and in a real-time nature. What's so exciting about this, we can zoom in and watch London as the Summer Olympics occur. We can watch people from France flying in. What are the hotels that they're staying at? What are the places that they're eating? What are the events that they're seeing? What about the Italians? What about Japanese? We can literally watch the world around us move and ebb and flow and understand it in fundamentally new ways. You might say, well, I'm a historian. How can big data possibly uh, play any role in my field? Imagine being able to assemble billions of pages of, of material uh, of the 19th century. Let's say you're interested in the Civil War. Imagine being able to take um, a, a substantial fraction of everything that survives from that time period to be able to map out the discourse around the Civil War and what it meant to be a Southerner, to literally watch the march to war play out in the thoughts, beliefs, grievances, and ideas as they move through time and space. Let's say you're a sociologist. We can watch society's reactions, commentary, beliefs, interests in real time, those things that make us human. For the first time in history, we can watch how a nation reacts as a monster hurricane marches up the coast. We can see someone in Los Angeles commenting on how their flight got delayed or canceled. We can see someone in Ohio uh, reach out uh, and send prayers to his brother-in-law in New York. We can literally watch someone in New York City tweet, the glass, the windows have shattered, there's glass everywhere, the roof is coming down, I should probably get out of here soon. The fact that someone would actually spend the time to tweet that the house is coming along and then decide to leave, this says something interesting about where we are today. We can watch a presidential election unfold. We can watch as people say, I love Obama, I love Romney. We can watch that dialogue play out and in real time and see how all of this goes together. What about an artist? Let's say you're an artist. You might say, well, there's no way big data could possibly play a role for me. Today, you can turn to Google Images. Let's say you're a graphic designer. You can turn to Google Images, and you can see literally trillions of images uh, uh, giving you ideas for every possible concept that you might want to explore or represent. Let's say you're a photographer. You're going on vacation. You want to say, where are some interesting places that I might, wa that I might want to visit? You can literally use this as essentially a, a reconnaissance tool to go and say, well, I'm going to go visit Southern Australia um, next week. What are all the different things that might be interesting for me to go and visit and photograph? The UI Photos Phantasm Project, which was my undergraduate thesis, took me months to take more than a quarter of a million images photographing this entire, every inch of this entire campus. Today, as many images get made in a few weeks, uh, as people walk around and document everything around them with their cell phones. Think about how many of you go out on a Friday night and come home and post pictures on Facebook of, of all the th festivities. Uh, and I'm sure quite, quite a few of you were like, oh, geez. Uh, uh. But you think about the, do the live documentary you're making of what it's like to be a college student today in 2013. And 
a good portion of those images are probably geotagged or else you're adding other information to them. So you think about this transformation from having to manually create and maintain these archives of images to a world in which these archives are just created as a byproduct of daily human life. Healthcare. As medical records are increasingly becoming electronic, we can look across the country for outbreaks of disease in real time and over time to understand the effects of new treatments. Fledgling autodocs are beginning to assist physicians uh, in primary care by being able to pull together every known example of a given disease and all the different symptoms and varieties therein. Computational biology. Increasing computing power means we can visualize, model, synthesize, simulate complex molecular dynamics. We can assemble every medical trial, every paper, academic paper ever published on a given topic, bring all that together and look for the patterns that we never dreamed of asking were there. Genomics it costs $100 million to sequence a genome just a decade ago. Half a decade ago, it was $7 million to sequence a genome. Today, it's just $7,000. The cost is no longer in acquiring data. The cost today is in being able to process and store all of that incredible information that we're able to generate. Weather. We can increasingly use increasingly sophisticated sensors to peer inside of the natural phenomena. As we know a hurricane's coming, we can blanket the ground with little sensors that fly within the storm. We can watch it from radar stations nearby and from satellites overhead. We can look at almost every inch of that storm and capture it in ways that we can then visualize and use to understand these phenomena in new ways. By 2006, a single company, Walmart, constituted 2.3% of the entire US GDP. Their data archives are among the most comprehensive data on human behavior that exists. Every person that's ever walked into, a, walked into a Walmart, what they bought, what they did before they bought that, what did they buy with this, what did they ever, what did they ever bought in their lives? And using this, they have an incredible, incredible leading edge indicators to understand what's going to happen around us. What about political science? Today, for the first time, we can watch conflict and cooperation play out in the world around us. We can have maps where little red dots show up uh, in real time as riots begin around the world. We can see little green dots as peace appeals or promises are made as they occur anywhere in the world. We can plot out global reaction to a political leader and see, for example, when a dictator has lost global credibility and is likely on his way out. I want you to imagine a world in which everything we do, everything we say, everything we learn occurs in a digital form, in which we can process all this to map, model, synthesize, and understand human society in brand new ways. The entire knowledge-seeking process itself is beginning to shift with machines taking their first steps towards inquiry. Big data is touching every field of study, while the underpinnings of it are as old as analysis itself. We've suddenly reached a critical nexus in which the data, the machines, the methods are all here. No matter what field you're studying, big data offers an incredible opportunity in which the horizon is still in the distance and you can make your mark on the field. So in closing, I challenge each of you to go home tonight and spend just a few moments looking at how big data is shaping your field and take your first steps towards this exciting new future. Thank you very much.